right, hello everybody. Um, we are going to talk about transport in cells today, transport across their semi-permeable plasma membrane, and then we'll learn about something called water potential. Let's go ahead and get started. So there's a handful of sort of big questions that we hope we can answer by the time we're done. How does the cell control what is transported into the membrane? We'll learn about the membrane proteins. Why is transport of materials between the cell and its environment necessary for life? How does the environment influence living systems? And how do cells exist within the confines of the laws of thermodynamics? What? We're going to talk about that today? Really? Yeah, that's what we're going to look at. All right. Um, so um, as a general rule, things spread out. That's what the second law of thermodynamics says. So the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy, which at this point we're just going to call chaos. We maybe could define that a little bit better later, but right now we're just going to say the chaos of a system will increase unless energy is added to that system. So how is it that we get complex biological systems? How do we get a molecule as complicated as DNA if in general the universe is running out of energy? If chaos is supposed to be increasing over time? Well, the only way to get something as complicated as a biological system is to add energy. And that's adding energy through food or through sunlight. Um, so locally, we're adding it into the systems to build more complex molecules like DNA. But there's no increase in the net total energy of the universe. Now, you might be wondering, why are we looking at a messy room? So the whole idea is that this is an example of the second law of thermodynamics, that the room gets messier and messier unless energy is added into it. And we mean this literally. You have to take, you have to use energy to put things away. You have to use energy to fold clothes. You have to use energy to make beds. And so the room is going to become more and more and more chaotic unless energy is used to um, keep it nice and neat. All right. <coughs> so that'll tie in in just a minute. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is passive transport. Passive transport is movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Imagine a ball rolling down a hill. It happens automatically. You don't need to use any energy to get the process to happen. What you do need to pay attention to, and this is the trickier part of passive transport, is which molecules can actually um, be transported across the membrane through diffusion automatically without any kind of helpers. Um, so it says in the first diagram, small nonpolar, like write that down, small nonpolar molecules are passing between the phospholipids. Look at the diagram. Notice we're going from left to right. We're going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. What are small nonpolar molecules that might be transferring across the membrane like that? Oxygen and carbon dioxide are good examples. Oxygen needs to come into cells. Carbon dioxide needs to be um, released out of cells as a waste product. So then on the second diagram, the diagram on the right, you see that there is a, um, a protein that is facilitating the diffusion, we'll get to that, facilitated diffusion, um, of other molecules. So it says in the second diagram, a channel protein, I like to think of a channel as like a tunnel, um, allows ions that have charges, remember an ion has gained or lost electrons, um, or polar molecules that have a little bit of a charge um, to cross the membrane. So it's these, um, these membrane proteins that act like channels that allow um, things that are larger or things that are charged um, or polar to cross the membrane. All right, so let's talk a little bit about diffusion. Diffusion is the passive transport of molecules across a semi-permeable membrane. So take a look at the diagram here. We've got water on the left, we've got water on the right, and we've got a semi-permeable membrane in the middle. Um, there are sugar molecules shown in green, and the sugar molecules are too large to pass across the membrane. So if you take a look at the water on the left, there's less sugar, so that means there's more water. If we were to make an example, maybe on the left side, it's 10% sugar and 90% water. And on the right side, maybe it's 20% sugar and only 80% water. Water is going to travel from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's called osmosis, always moving from high to low. 
And it says, notice that the sugar molecules in the diagram are too large to pass through. So it's water that's moving. And now for the big reveal, I'm going to move my picture and look what happens um, afterwards. Water moves from the left to the, or from, yeah, from left to right. And we actually see an increase in the amount of water that's on the um, right side of the YouTube. Crazy. A YouTube. Um, the other thing that I will point out, I kind of like this diagram here because this is going to help us with water potential a little bit later. When there are solutes, when there are things dissolved in the water, um, water molecules have a tendency to kind of gather around them and they restrict the free motion of water. And so can you see that the water is kind of clumped on the right side? The water has kind of clumped around the solutes that leaves gaps for water to get in. And so lots of solutes actually does something called lowering the water potential. We're going to learn about that, but in, in a few minutes, we're not quite there yet. We're going to keep it simple first. All right, so we got to consider chemistry. And when we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about whether something is ionic, whether it's polar, that's going to be super important. So what can easily diffuse through the lipid bilayer? Again, something that's small and hydrophobic or nonpolar. Those things pass through um, because they are not repelled by the polar heads um, of the lipid bilayer. So you've got those phospholipids. They have a polar head and a nonpolar tail. What's it called when a molecule has a polar and a nonpolar area? Right, amphipathic. I know you said that or thought it. All right. Um, so anyway, it says, what does all the other stuff do? Channel and carrier proteins facilitate the diffusion of polar and charged molecules through the membrane. So I, I always want these... Um, diagrams to look just right. And sometimes I choose the wrong diagrams and these diagrams aren't perfect. What I want you to see is molecules going from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And that's not exactly what these glucose molecules are doing. It's kind of equal. Um, but notice that with the carrier protein, the shape is changing. So as the molecule touches it, it causes a conformational, is the word, conformational change. It goes from this shape to this shape, and it releases the glucose molecule on the other side. That's called a carrier protein. No ATP is necessary. Um, it is the presence of the um, molecule, glucose in this example, that changes the shape. That is what causes the conformational change. Um, in the far right um, protein that we're looking at, that's a channel protein and it's basically open and it allows certain um, ions or polar molecules to pass through. Okay, so I've mentioned these words before. Facilitated means helped. Anytime you're facilitating something, you're helping out. So facilitated diffusion is just helping diffusion to occur. Um, it's diffusion, so no ATP is required, and we're moving again from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So facilitated diffusion is another way of saying that diffusion is happening, but it's happening through a membrane protein. So channel proteins are just tunnels. Carrier proteins carry the ion or molecule across the membrane by changing shape. All right, and then the last thing to mention, water, super important, is small. We said small nonpolar things can go between the lipid bilayer. Well, water is small and polar. So does that mean water can or cannot cross the lipid bilayer? And it turns out that's a really tricky answer. Um, it, because it's small, it can actually pass through the lipid membranes, so between the phospholipids. However, it moves really slowly, and that's because it's polar and it gets into trouble as it's moving across. So to be more efficient in gaining water or losing water, your cell membranes have channel proteins that are called aquaporins. It's the best name ever. It totally is what it makes sense. That didn't make sense. It is what the name implies. There we go. Aqua means water and pour pores. They're little tunnels that allow water to go scooting through quickly. So membrane, so water typically crosses the membrane through channel proteins called aquaporins. Next is a scary word called tonicity. And it's not that scary, but it's a super important concept. If I were you, I would draw this entire diagram with every single label. You need to know everything about this. You need to understand everything about it. 
So tonicity just says it's the relative measure of solution concentration. We're going to make it a little bit more difficult in a few minutes when we talk about water potential, but right now we're just going to talk about solution concentration. The tonicity of a cell's environment has serious consequences for the cell. So if the concentration of water, we're just going to focus on water right now. If the concentration of water is wrong, I'm just going to say wrong, it could cause a cell to swell and burst. Look at that animal cell in the first area. It could cause a cell to shrivel up. Um, it could cause a cell to work really efficiently. And it just depends on the concentration of water outside that cell. So super important. So things that you need to know. Animal cells, it's really important that you understand that animal cells don't have cell walls. So animal cells can't handle an influx of water. If water starts coming into an animal cell, it will swell and then pop like a balloon, like a water balloon pops. Plant cells have a cell wall, and so they develop something that's called turgor pressure. It's the pressure that happens because of the cell wall. High turgor pressure is good for a plant because plants don't, especially green plants, woody plants have sort of a skeleton, like a simulated skeleton, but green plants don't have any kind of a skeleton. The only way that green plants can stand upright is if there's water pressure inside of them and it allows them to stand like this. So we wanna put a lot of water, especially in that central vacuole, and it pushes against the cell membrane and the cell membrane pushes against the cell wall and you've got this water pressure and it allows the plant to stand upright. If water leaves a plant cell, the plant will start to wilt. And if it goes too far, there's nothing we can do. The, the cell, we call it, it plasmalized. And you can't come back once the cell has been plasmalized. So let's learn some of these terms here. Hypotonic means, the, the prefix hypo means less. But this can be confusing, less or more here. We're talking about the solute, the dissolved substances. So hypotonic means there's less dissolved substances on the outside side, but it means there's more water on the outside than inside the cell. So a hypotonic solution, um, the most classic example of hypotonic is distilled water. Distilled water is 100% water and 0% solute. So it's the ultimate hypotonic solution. So when it's 100% water on the outside, let's say the inside of this animal cell that we're looking at, let's say it's 90% water on the inside. I made that number up, but it works. So water is going to always diffuse. We call it osmosis from high concentration to low concentration. So the water is going to go from the outside of the cell where it's 100% to the inside of the cell where it's 90%. And that animal cell is going to start bloating and then it's going to burst. And bursting is called lysing. So the cell has lysed in the diagram. And obviously that's really bad for an animal cell. We don't want that to happen. So the ideal for an animal cell is what's called an isotonic solution. Iso means same. There's a million prefixes that mean same. Iso is one of the prefixes that means same. So that means the water concentration on the outside is the same as the water concentration on the inside, or the solute concentrations are the same. So water is going to enter, but it's going to leave at an equal rate. And so that should have no impact on the cell size. It won't shrink or it won't swell. Good for an animal cell. Um, and I can't remember if I wrote that down. Okay, so then hypertonic solution. The word hyper means um, increased or higher than. So that means that there are more solutes on the outside of the cell, so more dissolved substances. And that means that then there's less water on the outside than what's on the inside. So let's go with 90% again. Let's say the cell is a 90% water solution, 10% solutes, 90% water. And then on the outside, let's just say it's ocean water. And let's say, I'm making up numbers, let's say it's 15% salt and 85% water. So now if you look at that cell, 90% on the inside, the water is going to go from high concentration to low. 90 is the higher number, 85 is the lower number, out, which is outside. So water is going to leave the cell and that animal cell is going to shrink. It can't function correctly and that is certain death for it. This is why we don't drink ocean water when we're stranded in the ocean. If you have, like if you're swimming in the ocean and you swallow some water, 
doesn't matter at all because you can always rehydrate with another glass of water, fresh water, or, you know, go have a pop or whatever, and you're going to rehydrate. It's not a problem. The issue is when it's the only water that your body can drink, the actual content of the ocean water is less than the content of the water in your cells. And so it actually dehydrates you more than if you had never had anything to drink in the first place, no ocean water to drink in the first place. So stay away from ocean water. Um, okay, so take a look at the plant cell now. The plant cell loves a hypotonic solution like distilled water. Water rushes in, we've got high turgor pressure. We say that it is turgid. Look at the words, make sure you feel comfortable with that. Um, in an isotonic solution, even though it's great for us, that's not necessarily the best for green plants. They get a little wobbly when they're in isotonic solutions. So when the, the pressure is starting to decrease a little bit. But what's terrible for plants is a hypertonic solution. In that case, the water is leaving the cell, the, the central vacuole is shrinking, it's no longer putting pressure, and it's like, imagine if your skeleton collapsed, that's what's happening to the plant. Its skeleton, its water pressure is collapsing, and so the plant wilts. Um, and that's called plasmalizing. Now, here's a bit that I just want to make sure you're all solid on that. Um, we can use concentrated salt water as an example again. That is an impending problem in Minnesota. Um, because of winter in Minnesota, we add salt to our roads to try to melt the ice. And we'll learn about why that helps melt ice in chemistry um, term four. So anyway, it helps to melt ice, but ice never, I'm sorry, salt never, ever, ever goes away. It stays in the environment. And so as we're adding more and more and more salt, we're increasing the salinity, not only of our soil, but some of that washes into our rivers and our lakes. And so we're increasing the salinity of our lakes. Well, what does that do to all life that's used to living in freshwater? So any plants that are in the lakes, it is plasmalizing them. Any um, fish that are living in the lakes, it's pulling the water out of them. Um, so Minnesota has to figure out how to um, step away from salt. We've got to start um, figuring out ways to not use salt on our roads. Okay, um, I guess we'll go with that. Um, next, I just want to see, want you to see a couple quick examples of how animals um, use, how they have adaptations to handle different salt concentrations. So the paramecium, this little cute guy on the left, um, has this beautiful contractile vacuole. It looks like a little flower and it squeezes and it shoots water out. So if the paramecium is in a hypotonic solution where water is rushing in, I forgot to remind you, um, students taught me this long time ago and I've used it ever since. To remember what happens in a hypotonic solution, they said, KJ, we think of hypo-hippo. Well, what does a hippopotamus look like? If you were going to describe what a hippo looks like, right? It's big, bloated, gigantic, or, or enormous animal. Okay, so water, you can imagine water rushing into this little critter here and it getting all big and bloated like a hippo. So hypo hippo. So if paramecium is in a hypotonic solution, water's gonna rush in, but it has an adaptation called a contractile vacuole to push water out. It is active transport, so that means that it's using ATP. So it can't do it forever. It's going to, you know, it's like us running forever. It's pumping and pumping and pumping. It needs to be in an isotonic solution so that it's not wasting energy. Now, here's the sad part. If you throw this paramecium into the ocean, its contractile vacuole only pumps water out. Well, if it's in a hypertonic solution, water is going to be leaving it already. Even if it stops um, contracting its contractile vacuole, it's still going to shrivel up. And that is certain death for the paramecium. All right. And then we've got marine fish and freshwater fish. And just a couple things to be aware. So the word osmoregulation refers to the regulation of water and how um, marine organisms deal with it versus freshwater. So the first thing to be aware of is they're eating and drinking salt water. So salt is coming into their bodies. They have to do something to, otherwise they would shrivel up just like a freshwater fish would shrivel up in the um, in the ocean. So they have two adaptations. The first adaptation is to remove the salt from their bodies and they remove the salt through their gills. So they have that special adaptation. They also release less water in their urine so that they are holding on to their water more. And so that helps them be able to handle the salt water. 
vice versa, um, freshwater fish have a lot more water in their pee. Um, and so they're excreting that water out because water has a tendency to build up instead of leave their bodies. Okay, next. Um, one more thing. This is the same diagram we just saw. So this is really what I've been talking about with you is really simplistic math where I talked about like if it's distilled water is 100% water and then inside is 90%. I call that the honors biology level of math that we're doing. But we're going to step it up into the AP biology and we're going to talk about water potential. The difference really has to do with the plant cells. I just want you to imagine this for a second. So take a look at the plant cell that is turgid, the one that's in a hypotonic solution. So imagine it's in distilled water. Initially, that 100% water is going to be entering the cell and we'll say the cell is at 90% water. What's going to happen to the percent water as water enters it? Well, the percent water is going to start increasing, but it will never achieve equilibrium. It can never go from pure water, like this can never have, it's got solutes in it, they're stuck in there, they can't escape, so it'll never reach equilibrium. So water will keep rushing in. At some point, water can't fit in anymore. That's because there's this cell wall that keeps it and exerts another pressure on it, um, and we call that pressure potential. Um, and that's what we have to figure out. That's what we're going to be looking at. Is So this is eventually the water entering is going to start slowing down, and eventually it won't be able to enter anymore. So the 100% and 90% just gets us started, but it doesn't get us to really figure out how things are going to work. We're going to get a vague idea of it. We're not going to get it totally mastered today, but we'll get the idea. All right, so let's take a look at water potential. So water potential is kind of like what we've already been talking about, the tendency for water molecules to enter or leave due to osmosis. Okay, water potential is calculated. It's a kind of intimidating um, equation, but I want you to see that it's actually really simple. So that's the Greek letter psi. It's spelled P-S-I. Um, and I know that the Bozeman video encouraged you to think of Poseidon to help you remember that, like his trident that he holds whatever. Um, and so it says here, the way you read this is the water potential of the cell equals the solute potential plus the pressure potential. So the pressure potential is kind of like the cell wall pushing on it and exerting pressure to the inside. The solute um, potential has to do with the um, the interference of solutes with how water is moving. So let's go through this. Um, it says it right here. So psi S stands for solute potential. Psi P stands for pressure potential. Pressure is measured in bars. You need to know that. There's many different ways to measure pre pressure. You can measure it in atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, inches of mercury, bars. Um, we're going to stick with bars when we're doing water potential. An open beaker has a pressure potential of zero, and you just need to know that. So it should be written down. Open water of beaker has a pressure potential of zero, and that's going to happen repeatedly in story problems that we're trying to answer. All right, the next three things are quotes from our Biozone ebook. Um, I'm going to suggest that you write down just the first one, but not the second two bullet points. So it says the presence of solutes, like sucrose, for example, lowers water potential because the solutes restrict the movement of water molecules. Do you remember we saw a diagram a little bit earlier? It's in the Bozeman video too, where there was a solute and then the water molecules were gathered all around and there was some space that lowers the solute or that lowers the um the solute potential um, because more water can move in then can move into those spaces. Pure water has the highest, this is kind of weird, so just let it sink in. Pure water, which is distilled water, has the highest water potential possible. Zero. Everything else is negative. It's always going to be in a negative unless it's distilled water. So it says dissolving any solute in water lowers the water potential, makes it more negative. So write one of those things down and you're good to go. Okay, I'm moving on. So continuing, oh, and I should have said this really quickly. Even though this is really an intimidating equation, it's as easy as five equals three plus two. You just add them up. You, there's two numbers and you add them, big deal. It's not hard to do. However, of course, um, one of the... Um, variables here is a little bit more complicated than that. So we need to talk about that. So the solute potential, which is shown with the psi and the s, is a little bit more complicated. Its equation is negative i CRT. 
So what do these things stand for? So negative I, or just the I, is the ionization content constant. And that's a super intimidating phrase. And it's trust me, it's going to be super wickedly easy. And you're going to be like, oh, I love it when it's easy. So just trust me, but you're going to be intimidated when you first hear it. I is the ionization con a constant. It is telling us the number of particles produced when the, when the molecule dissolves. So let me give you an example. Sucrose is a really common example. We dissolve sucrose in a, um, in a beaker. Sucrose is a disaccharide. When sucrose dissolves in water, it remains as a disaccharide. It's one molecule. So the ionization content, set, constant, why do I keep saying content? The ionization constant is one because sucrose stays as one molecule. Glucose, when it dissolves, is a monosaccharide. When it dissolves, it stays a monosaccharide. Its ionization constant is one. Salt, however, when it dissolves in water, it breaks into a sodium ion and a chlorine ion. There are two different ions in that case. So the ionization constant for salt is two. And here's the really good news. <coughs> For every story problem that we ever do in this class, there are only two possibilities for ionization content, constants. Either it stays whole and we give it a one, or it breaks in half and we give it a two. And really the only things I've ever seen story problems written about, sucrose, glucose, or salt. It could be a different type of salt, like potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride, but it's still going to be the same thing. It's going to divide into two. So I just don't think it's ever going to get harder than one or two. All right. C stands for concentration. It's the molar concentration, which we haven't learned a whole lot about yet. <coughs> We learned um, in honors chemistry term one what a mole was. So molar concentration is usually abbreviated with a capital M, that's molarity, and that's the number of moles in one liter. So just you're going to have that in a, in a story problem, it'll say like the mo molarity is 1.0 or the molarity is 3.5. Um, and so that's the molar concentration. R is a number that's going to be the same the whole time. Oh, and I should have mentioned this. All of this stuff is on your formula sheet that or equation sheet that um, AP gives you. So I will give you these formulas um, on our tests and the AP exam will have them on there so you can look up everything. You don't have to memorize negative ICRT. You don't have to memorize this pressure constant that you're looking at right now. Um, it's on that equation sheet. So the pressure constant is always 0 0.0831, get a load of that um, label, liters, bars per mole Kelvin. So why is it that way? It'll make sense a little bit later, but just trust me that that's what the constant is. You are always going to use that same number. The last letter stands for temperature, um, and it would be lovely if it was just in Celsius, but it is not. Um, you may or may not have heard of Kelvin. Kelvin is another, just like Celsius and Fahrenheit, it's another temperature scale. It is equivalent to Celsius. However, instead of starting um, at at ice melting, which that's where the Celsius scale starts. It starts at zero, which is ice melting. Um, instead, zero on the Kelvin scale is absolute zero, which is uh, for Celsius, it would be negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, I believe. Um, so anyway, so to, to convert between Celsius and Kelvin is actually super easy. It's just 273 plus whatever the degrees Celsius are. And guess what? Even that's on your equation sheet. <coughs> so you don't have to memorize that either. Woo! All right, so let's try a couple of problems. This first problem is going to be wickedly easy, and you're going to be like, really, that all this talking for just that will get a little bit trickier, but even then, you guys can totally do this. So it says, if a plant sells pressure potential, I always have trouble remembering what those all those symbols mean. Pressure potential is 2.5 bars. That means the pressure that the cell wall is pushing on the water on the inside. And the solute potential, always negative if it's not distilled water, is a negative 4.25 bars. What's the overall water potential? Well, that's just... Um, the, that's just the pressure potential plus the solute potential. It's that simple. So put them together, negative 1.75 bars. 
okay, KJ, that was really unsatisfying. I have no idea what we just calculated or why we calculated it or who cares. Okay, let's try a problem where maybe you would care a little bit. Um, it says, if the plant cell above is then placed in an open beaker of pure water, Remember that pure water, um, it has no, it's, it's um, water potential is zero. So an open beaker of pure water, its total water potential is zero. If it was, if it was salt water, then its solute potential would be negative, but its pressure potential would still be zero. In this case, it's open and it's distilled water. The whole thing is a big fat zero. So the question is, if you take the cell from above that's at negative 1.75 bars and you put it into um, distilled water at zero, is water going to go in or out of the cell? And remember that that's really important, even though you're like, I don't know why we're doing this. It's really important to whether a plant lives or dies, um, whether water is entering it or leaving it. So water is always going to travel, this is osmosis, from high water potential to low water potential. So wrap your brain around it. Is zero higher or lower than negative 1.75? So does water go in or does water go out? Okay, zero is higher than negative 1.75, so water will travel from the beaker into the cell, and we will have a turgid cell. Okay, let's try another. Oops, let me get my picture out of the way. Let's try another example. This one's going to be a little bit trickier. We're going to need to use that um, solute formula that is negative ICRT. So it says the value for water potential in a plant cell was found to be negative 6.7 bars. So they figured that out for us, and I put it in the diagram there, negative 6.7 bars. It should have the label. If the plant cell is then placed in a 0.5 molar solution, so look at it in the beaker, a 0.5 molar solution of sucrose. Let's see, does sucrose break apart in water or does it stay whole? And so does that mean its ionization is its ionization constant? Is it one or two? At 10 degrees Celsius, oop, it needs to be in Kelvin. In an open beaker, open beaker, mm, pressure potential in an open beaker. Um, what is the total water potential of the solution and in which direction would the net water of flow, what net water of flow, net flow of water be? Okay, so let's break it down. Let's get that solute potential first before we figure out the whole water potential. So solute potential, negative ICRT. So sucrose does not break down. So we're going to have one. Do you see in the first parentheses, we have a one because it doesn't break down. Next comes C, that's concentration, 0.5 molar. There it is in parentheses, 0.5 molar. Next R, that's that constant that it's on your equation C, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.0.0.0831. Hard for me to talk. Liters bars per mole Kelvin. Um, and then the temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. To, to convert that into Kelvin, we need to add 273. If you multiply it all out, please, please don't forget the negative sign in the front. I'm guessing 10 of you are going to forget them, the negative sign on the test, and it's going to screw up your answers. So the answer for the solute potential is negative 11.7. 76 bars. Now remember, water potential is solute potential plus pressure potential. However, this is an open beaker that we're trying to solve right now. So the pressure potential of an open beaker is zero, even though the solute potential was lower than that. The pressure potential is zero. So you add them together and you still have a negative 11.76. So now we're going to add 11.76 outside of the cell. So do you see it in the beaker? So now the question is, again, this is just a little bit of brain gymnastics. Which way is the water going to go? It goes from high concentration or high water potential to low water potential. Which number is higher and lower? Okay, negative 6.7 is higher and negative 11.6 is 76 is lower. So water will leave. This is a hypertonic solution and the cell will plasmalize. Okay, we are near the end. I'm just going to talk through active transport here really quickly. So we've all that stuff prior to this was passive transport. What's most important to remember is it's always moving from high to low, the passive transport's moving from high to low concentration, and no energy is ever used. 
Active transport's the opposite of that. So active transport moves what we call against the concentration gradient. So instead of moving from high to low the way it's supposed to move, we're moving it, we have to force it to go uphill from low to high. And that requires energy. And the only way we can use that energy is through um, membrane proteins. So those proteins are gonna um, use the energy that's released from ATP to move molecules the, the wrong way. Um, the other time that active transport is necessary is when molecules are really large. So for example, a protein. So I, I gave this example to students. Like glucose is like this big, sucrose is like this big, and a protein is like this big. Okay, so proteins absolutely cannot pass the cell membrane. So if it's something really, really humongous, um, then we need to do endo or exocytosis where the whole cell membrane, you remember that from the other unit, um, the whole cell membrane pinches in or a uh, vesicle forms and pushes a whole giant thing out of it. But what's interesting, and I, I say this to students all the time, um, those diagrams, when they show endo and exocytosis, they never show the ATP being used. They always show the ATP being used on these diagrams um, that I have on the screen here. Um, so just be aware, I've researched it a bajillion times, endocytosis and exocytosis are active transport, but they never show the ATP in the diagrams. Makes me makes me frustrated because, you know, I want you to see the ATP. So look at this diagram. Is this active or passive transport? Well, I know it's active transport for two reasons. I see that we're going from low concentration to high concentration, and I see that ATP is being used. Quick reminder that what's happening is that um, ATP is dropping off one phosphate group the phosphate group is fully charged. It has, I think it's even a negative two charge. Don't quote me on that. Um, but it's fully charged. So when it touches that protein, remember proteins have um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. The tertiary and technically the quaternary maybe even the secondary structure, I had to think about that one a little bit, would be impacted by the presence of that phosphate group. That phosphate group is either going to attract other polar molecules or repel nonpolar molecules, R groups. When I say polar and nonpolar, we're talking about the R groups. And that's going to cause the protein to shift in shape. And that's what allows the molecules to be shuttled across, to be moved across to the other side. So in this case, we're increasing the hydrogen ion concentration. And the question is, who cares? Why are we doing that? What would it matter? Well, the whole idea, look at the first one again, that's that proton pump. We're pumping these hydrogen ions across so that they can help bring sucrose into the cell. Now in the second diagram, that is actually passive transport. No ATP is being used in the second with the second protein. The hydrogen ions are helping the sucrose across, um, but it's not active transport. So that's called facilitated diffusion in that circumstance. Okay, um, one of the most famous um, of the active transport pumps is the sodium potassium pump. It creates um, an electrical um, gradient, I guess is the right word, um, that allows your nerve impulses to travel throughout your body. We will learn about it a little bit more later, but we need to understand how the sodium potassium pump works. And I should have showed you a video in class about how that works. So the basic idea here is that um, in the inside, the sodium collects inside of this um, carrier protein. And then an ATP drops off one of its phosphates. So now it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And that phosphate causes a conformational change in the protein. And so now the protein is facing this way and those um, sodium ions are released to the extracellular side of the, uh, of the membrane. Then, um, because it's open, now two potassium molecules can move in and they cause a conformational change and the phosphate falls off to be recycled back into ATP. It's brilliant recycling. And now the, the protein takes its original shape and so it returns back to the other way. So that's the sodium potassium pump and it's being triggered by the presence of a phosphate group from ATP. All right, last thing to talk about, um, bulk transport. This is also um, 
active transport. We just don't see in none of these diagrams do we see um, ATP being used. So the first thing they were talking about is endocytosis, the intake of big molecules. So it says um, on the first one, it's called phagocytosis and that's um, cell eating. I always think that looks like it's eating a poop and some people tell me that it looks like it's eating a Cheeto. I think that's more pleasant. So we'll say that it's eating a Cheeto. So that's endocytosis. It's taking in a large molecule. Um, drinking is actually bringing in liquids. And then the, um, that's called pinocytosis. And then finally, um, receptor mediated endocytosis means that there are these little receptors. Do you see their red Ys? Um, those are the receptors and they're basically waiting in place until a certain signal molecule, it's called a ligand, until it shows up and that triggers endocytosis. And that ligand is there for a reason and it tells the cell something is going on and you need to do endocytosis. So it's just the cell, um, deciding when or when not to um, do endocytosis. And then lastly, exocytosis is exactly the same process, but in reverse. Um, we're taking vesicles and we're merging them with the outside of the cell membrane. So that vesicle has a phospholipid bilayer and it has proteins embedded in it. And as it melds with the cell membrane, then those proteins get added to the cell membrane and those phospholipids get added to the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is kind constantly changing. It can be increasing in size um, as exocytosis happens, and it will decrease in size as endocytosis happens. Okay, everybody, that is it. I'm just going to really quickly, you could shut me off right now. I'm just going to go over the what do you gotta know? What are the things that are most important? Okay, first of all, second law of thermodynamics says chaos increases unless energy is added. Living things add energy via food, sunlight, or sunlight to maintain organization. Passive transport, no ATP needed. Molecules are moving from high to low concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. That means that small things can pass through. That's what semi-permeable means. If it's water that's moving across, we call it osmosis. S only small nonpolar molecules can diffuse across the membranes. Remember that water is small and polar. It can diffuse slowly, but not very well. So that's why water uses aquaporins. Facilitated diffusion simply means that diffusion is being assisted by membrane proteins. Those could be channel proteins or they could be carrier proteins. As long as ATP is not being used and as long as we're going from high concentration to low concentration, it's called facilitated diffusion. And then again, water uses aquaporins. Tonicity refers to whether a solution is hypo, iso, or hypertonic. I want you to remember hypo, hippo, that water is going to enter the cell and that makes the cell either if it's an animal cell, it'll burst, or if it's a plant cell, it becomes turgid. Water rushes in. Isotonic is equal. That's good for a, an animal cell. Not that good. It's meh for a, um, a plant cell. And then hypertonic deadly for all types of cells. Nobody can live, uh, unless you're specifically adapted to live in salt water, um, for example, concentrated salt water. All right, and then the last thing is to talk about water potential and active transport. Um, water potential determines whether water will move into or out of a cell, and you need to know those two equations, but they're on your equation sheet. Um, and then finally, active transport is the movement against the concentration gradient. So from low to high concentration, it uses membra membrane proteins and ATP. Um, charged phosphate groups from ATP are what change the structure of the protein. And then it's also for moving large um, molecules, so through bulk transport like endo and exocytosis. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. I hope you all have a fabulous day. Let me know if you have any questions.